Hello, I am here with Douglas Maxwell, who is the writer of A Respectable Widow Takes to Vulgarity. Yeah, that's a great title to start Thank off you. with. It's brilliant. Uh, do you want to say a wee bit about what the play is about? Well, it starts with that premise and goes on. It's about a, it's a, really, it's about a woman whose husband dies and she meets a wee guy at a funeral who uses a swear word mm -hmm. in a Scottish way that she's never heard before. And she kind of goes off on a spin, trying to, an investigation of swearing. Yeah. Um, really, between you and I, it's my fair lady in reverse. <laughs> yeah. and she kind of finds herself through this language. You know? And it, it, the slight or bigger picture of it is it's about what happens if you don't have the vocabulary to express how you feel. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're left with two choices. One is you don't express how you feel. Two, you go and find oh, right, right. Know, ways, to, yeah. ways to speak, yeah. which is what she does. And it's about, you know, she goes in the spin and she learns all the different swear words and so on. It's a comedy. Um, yeah. yeah. And you mentioned My Fair Lady in it. So it does, it does have that, it plays with the, those ideas of class and yep. age and those, the, the, the differences between the two characters and, and trying to find their common ground and the differences between language and... Yeah, it's, it. a, it's a direct spin on it. Um, that it's flipped. Yeah. That she finds the use, the, the vulgarity and the profanity opens up something in her. The joy of it. Yeah. yeah. And she can express how she feels it. The whole play builds up to one line towards the end where she says something very true that she didn't know she felt. And she uses the language to say something profound about herself, mm -hmm. where it's been used comically before. And there's a couple of direct nods to my fair lady. There's a scene at a football ground that echoes the movie yeah. of Blooming Arse. Yeah. You know, all that. <laughs> yeah. And this is the first um, of uh, the three plays that we're doing that were originally part of the dream plays for Hush Readings at the Tavern. So it's been a wee while since you, you wrote this. So it's nice to kind of revisit it and see it on a... Yeah, I mean, I, I'd written it before the dream plays. Um, I didn't quite live up to the brief of that, which was a thing they did during the festival at Traverse, which uh, seems from a play you'd never write. Mm -hmm. It's actually this play was already written. I write an awful lot just for myself, just to kind of keep busy. I, I try and dodge commissions and try and have a play growing by the time I let anyone know about it. Oh, so I'd written it and it had been in the drawer and I, of course, knew this is exactly the length of time of an Orrin Moore script. <laughs> yeah. I didn't send it to you because I was very worried about that. I don't know whether that's, I don't know how that audience will like it. And then Orla asked me about it and I let her read it, she loved it. And we did it at, in, at nine in the morning. Yeah, because it's very early. You know, yeah. And the audience went nuts for it. And I thought, well, oh, Christ, if they can deal with it at nine in the morning, maybe they can deal with it at lunch time. Yeah. Yeah. With a play of pie and a pint. I think a little bit. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, so have you got have you got ideas for plays brewing all the time and are you working on stuff at the moment? I, I, I try to. I'm, I'm working on two plays. I'm working on a big comedy for the MTS and I'm working on a play for the main stage of the sets. And actually nothing beyond that. But because I, I, um, I had sent the first drafts of those two plays in, so the spring of last year I had nothing to do and I dread that more than anything. So right. I'll just go to the desk and just work on anything. Speeches, little mini scenes, little small place, see if anything comes of it, mm. just to kind of keep the wheels turning and keep me fit. Yeah. And then um, that came out of it and another couple of wee things. After I, I saw this in rehearsal, so I went yeah. back to read the thing and the other ones were as good. <laughs> they were, there was a reason there in the bottom yeah. drawer. This, this one has escaped. Right. Yeah. Let's, yeah. let's just leave it at that. <laughs> Where do you get your um, your ideas from? Because other plays I've seen have got not, magic realism or comedy or yeah. kind of very dramatic and playful and... I try and I play, I play that when you describe it to somebody, say, that they say, well, that sounds good. That, that's the goal of it. And right. I test that out on lots of people. So they'll ask me what you're writing about, and I'll say, yes, I play about this and I play about that, until I've honed that little idea. Right, yeah, yeah. Until yeah, they yeah. say, well, that sounds good. Oh, I'm coming to the point now, much like this, where I want the title to tell you quite a lot about it. Yeah, yeah. So that people, and it's got a story on it, as far as where this idea came from, I think it might have been when my in-laws, my in-laws don't swear, and my family swears, but we work in a profession that swears, yes, you know, we're a swearing really. profession, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's we, not all professions are, we can forget, I think, yeah. you know, like if we go to a meeting, even with someone we've never met before, it's absolutely fine if we swear, because we assume they swear too, yeah. it's an easy assumption, yeah. but I forget that people don't swear, I always just assume they would be holding it in, yeah. Yeah. then I heard my father-in-law, 
in another room he didn't like and was listening, it was very angry about something. And he said, Oh my giddy aunt! <laughs> and I and I'm as angry as he could be. I thought it's just it's not in there, you know, yeah. the cabbage is not he, he would never say it. Yeah. However, on the other hand, if you think theatre people swear a lot, one of my friends is a bookie. And and he yeah, so and I thought and they know each other, you know, they've met through our wedding and mm -hmm. whatnot. Mm -hmm. And I just always imagined maybe my mother in law meeting my friend who was a bookie and you know what? You know, my, my, like my, they do the, the telegraph crosswalk and stuff like that. They're kind of knowledgeable about words. And yet, yeah. I don't think we would ever have heard that word used like that. Yeah. So it was, might, might, that might have been the start. Because right. actually, it was this shaking hands at the funeral. It was the first thing that came in my mind. It was, an, it was a funny premise. Let's see where it went. And as I wrote it, certain things cropped up. That it, you know, it was a brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, can you tell us a bit more about your NTS play? Your My NTS play is, I've changed the title to the silent treatment. It used to be called Sponsored Silence. It's about ten women trying to have a sponsor silence. So they're trying desperately not to speak. That sounds, uh, it's got a lot of uh, potential. Yeah. And the, other one, the, the, some, and the other one's a serious piece for the sets, which is about the south side of Glasgow, where I live, and um, in Governell, where set during 2008 when there was a murder in the park and closed the park. This kind of went a bit crazy. Yeah. Like, and I had my, my first daughter was born in that time. And I went a bit crazy. It's, it's a kind of madness. Um, so both of those are... I'm trying to... A couple of years ago I had something like 10 plays in 14 months. And it was too much. Not all professional, some, you know, your theatres and other things. I thought I would try fewer but bigger. Yeah. Try and, make, try and step up a bit and go, go a bit further. And that's been my challenge for the last few years. So that's where I'm trying to aim for. I'm, I mean, I only write plays, I don't write don't tell you tell radio. Or, so out, of, out of choice, that's you. Do, yeah, do. kind of half and half. <laughs> <laughs> I think the lack of ability would be quite It would be daft. <laughs> if you just write plays, the kind of inbuilt goal is to write a really good comedy and a really good tragedy. Yeah. You know, so I've started in the comedies, I write sad plays very often, emotive plays, but not tragedies. So I'm trying to kind of steer down that road, experiment that, and hopefully that's where it's going to go in the future. Fascinating, I look forward to that. Unless it's all over this week or tomorrow, you know, unless the career's dead. Unless they're like, no, that's too sweary. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt it. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes.